Welcome to the Musicians Institute. This is uh, students and alumni and probably a few people that snuck in. And I want to give a shout out to Loudwire. We've got some homies from Loudwire who are here to put on this event. If you've been to the conversation series before, you know how this works. We hang out up here for a little while and then we take some questions from y'all. I'm gonna make this the shortest introduction ever. Because it's, I mean, it, it, it's a cliche, right? Uh, this man needs no introduction, but this guy really doesn't. I call him the Dark Lord of the Riff. This is the man whose hands gave us heavy metal, the Hand of Doom, Mr. Tony Iommi. Have a seat, sir. I think that one's yours. Hello, hello. First and foremost, welcome. Thank you. Secondly, thank you for uh, literally an entire genre of music that has defined my life and probably everyone here. I mean, you're the guy. <laughs> I just want to get that out of the I'm way. I'm off then. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there's an awful lot I want to talk about, and something that we do at this conversation series is we talk a lot about the early days and sort of what shaped you as a person and, and where all of this came from. Um, so let's talk about growing up in Birmingham and some of your earliest introductions to music. What set you on this path? Yeah, well, Birmingham was... Uh, industrial city and um, when we first started or when I was young there wasn't a lot for young people to do you know it was uh, um, more gangs and it was a bit rough really to put it bluntly <coughs> um, so if you wasn't in a gang you you're pretty much an outcast you know where we lived um, but uh, I think we, when we got involved with music, that sort of got us out of that uh, idea of being in a gang. Yeah, it was work in the factory, join a gang, or be a musician. Those were kind of the choices. Yeah, but in our day, a musician was, if you say, I'm playing guitar, they go, oh, you're out of work then. You know, it was like, <laughs> you haven't got a job really. Uh, it, w it was never looked on in them days as as an important thing, you know, music, uh, being a, in a band was, was basically you're out of work. And that's how, that's how the older generation at our time looked on it. Um, so let's talk about some of those, uh, you know, Hank Marvin, The Shadows, some of those early, early inspirations that made you say, I want to participate, yeah. I want to pick up a guitar. Well, does anybody know Hank Marvin? Yes. Oh. <laughs> Um, That's there's, Hank there's, Marvin Jr. There's one then. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hank Marvin in my day was in a band called The Shadows and he was, um, they were like the top instrumental band in England. We only had one and, and that was them. And, um, <coughs> and they used to back this singer called Cliff Richards. And I sort of, uh, for me, I wanted to play, well, originally I wanted to play drums, but I couldn't have, a set of drums because for a start our house was about half the size of this stage um, and I'd have never been able to have a set of drums and I couldn't afford any anyway. So uh, uh, I had a guitar and I really took to the guitar and enjoyed it and The Shadows were a band that I would try and listen to as much as I could because I loved the sound, I loved the style of playing and and, that, and being instrumental, it, it allowed me to be able to learn these instrumental tunes. Not very good, but I used to have a go. And was that a lot of, of learning by ear? Did you it was it? all learning by ear. I never ever read music and I wanted it, I'm, I'm glad in a lot of ways because it comes out from inside as opposed to what's written there. So you play what you feel at that time. Oh. And uh, I would have liked in some ways to have, written, to have been able to read music, but I don't regret it. Do we have guitar players here? 
Right, I'm off then. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's also talk about something that was crucial, not only to your individual style of playing, but what to ultimately became heavy metal as a result, uh, which is the industrial accident that uh, cost you parts of your fingers, yeah. your fingertips. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about, some of you may not be familiar with that, and how... Uh, he knows that, no? <laughs> <laughs> um, and how that um, ultimately changed the way that you play and, and changed the way that yeah. all of us play. Well, I, I worked in a, a factory like most people are, are, from where I lived. Um, worked in a factory and I used to do, I learned to do welding, uh, gas welding and arc welding, electric welding. And so... Uh, I had this job, which was, was a good job, if you like jobs. Um, <laughs> uh, so, um, and uh, I'd be on a, like a line and they'd pass stuff down to me and I'd weld it and then it'd go on to somewhere else. And the one day, the person that would be sending me the, the uh, thing to weld, it never turned up, so they put me on this giant, huge press, I mean massive, a guillotine type press that would come down bang and bend the metal and so I'm there with this machine and um, I don't know, know what happened I must have pushed my hand in and of course bang it came down and it just took the ends I actually pulled them off as I, as I pulled my hand back it, it sort of pulled them off and it was left with two stalks sticking out the you know the bone sticking out the top of the finger but it's ironic because the, the day that happened, I was going to leave that job because I'd had an offer to join a band to go professional and to go to Germany and to, and to play in, uh, in Europe, which was for me a fantastic opportunity. And, um, and I'd rehearsed with this band and everything. And, and we, uh, I was due to. And I went, I went home for lunch, and my mother said, I said, I'm not going back. Now, I'm, that's it, now I'm finished. He went, you go back and finish off the job properly, you know, don't just leave like that, so, God. So I went back, and, and, and sure enough, that's what happened. I, I put me on the machine, bang. So, of course, my mother got total blame for that. <laughs> and, uh, but, you know, it's just the way things are. You just never know what's around the corner. And, and that happened, of course, and that changed my life entirely because I thought, well, that's it. I, I'm, I went to the hospital and they cut the bones off and then they said, mm, you might as well forget playing. And um, God, I was just so upset. And I wouldn't accept that there wasn't some way around it that I could be able to play. And so I sat at home, you know, being miserable and moping about and <clears throat> and, and, and eventually somebody, who were, the, the manager of the factory brought me a, a record around and it was a, an EP at that time and he says, oh just, I want you to listen to this. I went, oh no, I, I don't want to listen to this. I, you know, it's going to get more upset listening to another guitar player, you know. He said, no, listen to it. So I listened to it and I went, yeah, it's, it's really great. And then he said it was Django Reinhardt who had had a, you know, a, an accident to his hand as well. And so it really sort of inspired me more to be able to overcome what had happened. And so I went to different, I tried to look at see different doctors and they all said, no, you can't do it. And so I made my own tips. I made, I, I got a, a washing up bottle, a plastic bottle and, and, and melted it down into a, a ball and then I got a hot soldering iron and would drill a hole out in it and, and, and fit it over my finger. So there's this big ball on my finger. And, <clears throat> and then I'd sit there for days just rubbing it down to make a shape of a, of a finger. And I mean, it took a long time and, it, and I'm trying to play with it and it, it, was, it hurt and it, 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 I couldn't bend any string or anything. So I, I had to come up with an idea of what I could put on to grip the string. And I tried different cloths and material and just ripped off. And I had this old leather jacket. Um, 
uh, from my rocker days. And so I, I decided to cut it up and put a bit of, try this leather, and it was great because it was a really old jacket. And um, glued it on, and it worked. But then I had to persevere for a long, long time to get to be able to get used to working with them. Because you imagine a big thing on the end of your finger, you know, it's, and trying to find a guitar, you can't feel anything. Yeah. You can't feel the guitar And string. then the amount of nerves that we have in our fingertips. And it was painful. It was painful. So I'd, I used to try and put tape underneath it so it'd buffle uh, 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 it a bit, you know. It reminds me of, uh, you know, like a, it's a movie trope of like heist movies where, you know, it's one more job, one more bank, you know, mm. going back, going into the, the factory and yeah. I'm almost yeah. done here and then that happens. Um, tell us a little bit then too about how that also changed, uh, you know, the, the string gauges that you played and the, the tunings that you played in and all these things well, sort of it, eventually. It, it sort of changed everything, really. I mean, not just that. It, it, the whole guitar had to be different for, for, for me. And so I'd sit work. I mean, I learned a lot about the guitar, that's for sure. <laughs> I'd have the thing in bits every day, everything off, bridge off the lot, doing the neck, filing all the frets down, and, uh, and just trying to get it as easy as I could that I wouldn't have to press hard on the strings. Uh, so I made it as the, the strings as low as, uh, the frets as low as I could without them you know, going horrible. Uh, and then I went to the next stage of trying to find light strings, which of course th there was no light strings in them yeah. days. They were all heavy, quite heavy really. <clears throat> and if you're normal fingers, it's fine, but when you're like this, it's painful. Uh, so I had to make uh, a setup of my own, um, and I, I bought some banjo strings. And um, I used the first banjo strings because they were light. And then I dropped the gauge down so that it would make basically a light gauge set. And that's what I did. I used that for, for, for years. And then I went to string companies saying, you know, can you make me some light gauge strings? I went, light gauge strings, you can't do that. I said, you can. I said, I've got them, I've, I've, <laughs> I use them. I went, no, nah, they'll never sell. They'll never do any good. It's really peculiar, isn't it? You know? <clears throat> and I found this company in Wales called Picato, and uh, they said, we'll make them for you. So they made me my own sets of these light gauge strings. And I used them for, for years. And then, of course, other companies then started doing light gauge strings, you know. But um, it's ironic. You have to sort of prove everything before it, anybody will accept and have a go at it. Of course. I mean, that's, you know, not to, not to put you on the spot, but that's innovation. That's what innovators do. That's, yeah. you know, you blaze a trail for that's right. yeah. the rest of us to follow. Um, let's talk about some of your early bands. Um, of course, everybody knows one band in particular. Uh, but pr prior to that, there were... I don't know them. <laughs> <laughs> prior to that, uh, the Rock and Chevrolets, I think, was a band. Of course, Earth, I think more of us are probably familiar with than some of the others. But what were some of the, the early band <laughs> situations like? Well, I think, actually, the first gig I ever had was just me with a drummer and a, pian a, a piano player. And they were about 30 years older than me. And uh, it was in a pub, and I wasn't old enough to even be in the pub. Hmm. And I'm play they asked me if I'd play with them, and oh, God, I've never done it before. I don't know what to do, you know. And that was my first experience of playing in front of people. Um, and th then, uh, you know, I just more practice and practice and practice. And then I, I got together with this uh, band, they were called the Rocking Chevrolets. And it was like really funny because they all had the suits and all the stuff, you know, the gold lame suits and very over the top, really. It was great because it meant we, had, we could go and do uh, shows, but it was all pubs. And again, I wasn't probably old enough to be in playing in these pubs. Uh, but, uh, but it was good. It was a great experience for me to be able to play with other people. 
And was it a mix of covers and originals or? Oh, originals, not in them days. No, it was all, <laughs> all, go on. Yeah. It was all covers, all covered stuff. And, and with the name Rock and Chevrolets, I would imagine it was very American rock and roll. It was rock and roll stuff, yeah, yeah. I think after that, I, I can't remember what I did after that. But eventually I ended up in a band uh, in, in, towards Scotland. Uh, I joined this band. And the drummer at that time was about to leave, so I thought, oh, great. So I got Bill in. I got uh, Bill in the band. Uh, actually, before that, I was in a band with Bill called The Rest. And uh, they were quite good. And we used to do a lot of, again, pubs and clubs and stuff. <coughs> and then when I, when I left them, I went to, to, to uh, Cumberland to join this other band. And then that's when I got Bill in and all the rest of the stuff. And we were with them for a year and we really built up a great following. <coughs> the sound and everything came about because uh, we didn't want a, another guitar player. We didn't want a rhythm guitar player. Or in them days, it was a rhythm guitar player. Or keyboard player. There, a lot of people had keyboard players and we didn't want a keyboard player. We didn't want a rhythm guitar player. We wanted just bass, guitar, drums and vocals. And we wanted to make the sound as big as we could. And so I used to experiment a lot of trying different things to make it sort of a bigger sound. I play closer together. He played the same sort of thing as me and bend the strings a bit, make it fatter. It went on from that to tuning down and using thicker strings, but tuning down and just trying different ideas, you know, to create a different sound. And it, I think it worked. And what? what <laughs> I think so. Uh, what sort of reactions were you getting to tuning down? Because even that, uh, you know, that's such a common thing to our ears now. But that had to have been like melting people's minds, <laughs> and, you know, in certain well, I don't areas. Know if, I don't know if it did in them days because most people didn't play in tune anyway. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it was a <laughs> and there weren't sort of things as strobes and all that sort of business in them days. It was just like, you know, you tune up. But what are you tuned to? Oh, I don't know. Um, so it was like the, the tuning fork, you know, bing. Um, <clears throat> so it, no, it didn't really sort of, I think it caught on later when people realized that we did tune down, much later. When yeah. you got sort of, you know, bands like uh, Soundgarden and Metallica and all these sort of bands that were influenced by it. I think those bands have heard Black Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one might say. Yeah, it's a good guess. And I think one of the uh, most prominent things about your reputation, obviously you're the inventor of heavy metal and the riff, riff lord, the dark lord of the riff, as I like to call you, um, but also your work ethic, your tireless um, professional. And you know when you talk about the early days, it sounds like that's really where a lot of that developed, that idea of if the van's not working, somebody's got to get out and push and yeah. playing multiple sets and figuring out how to fill up the space and, and you know, going all the way back to, like you said, uh, deconstructing and reconstructing and reverse engineering your actual instrument to make it work for you. Yeah. Um, that continued through your career through all now. All my life, yeah. I've never been able to just turn my back on things. I have to sort of see it through and it's always been the way. And um, <coughs> which uh, if I believe in something enough, I'll, uh, you've got to do it and you've got to continue doing it. It sort of worked for the band as well because they come to me if, uh, to look to me, what should we do now, you know? Which was good and bad because I sort of, yeah, I didn't want that. I want to be a band and uh, uh, all together. But, you know, it, it was the way it was. And, uh, but I've always had that, uh, that thing about not being able to give up, not give up and see it through and uh, believe in what I'm doing. Yeah, having uh, interviewed a lot of musicians over the years, I've identified this, this role that's common in a lot of bands. I call it the band boss, where, yeah, it's a bit of a blessing and a curse to be sort of the guy that everyone's looking to to be in charge. Uh, it, it is, really, yeah. Um, and I think on our la when we finally got back together again, I, uh, uh, when we did the album 13, the album 13, Black Sabbath? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you know, I've always been involved in the production and, uh, and f following everything through. But when we got to that album, we had Rick Rubin come in, who 
you know, it seemed weird working with somebody, but you have to, I wanted to put it into somebody else's hands and me be a part of the band instead of, well, this is what we've got to do now. I didn't want to be doing that. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was good in a way because it, it, it sort of, even though I did poke my nose in, um, it, it's difficult to stay out. You know?